Morning, everyone. I'm tempted to say the Lord be with you, but I don't want to make you too Anglican, so I won't say it this morning. So my name is uh, Hugh, Hugh Isaacs. I'm the uh, acting lead pastor at the moment and uh, filling in for a few months here. Well, we did, uh, as you may have gathered by now, have a, a, uh, a men's night last night. And uh, I thought, right, uh, there's going to be meat, there's going to be barbecues, there's going to be cooking, there's going to be men's stuff. Sort of uh, getting into my mood for being a hunter-gatherer, you know, killing meat and roasting it on the fire. What do I find when I get here? Well, there's fire. No. The fire's not in the ground, it's in a 44, half 44-gallon 44 uh, drum. But there's no cooking. On the fire. We're just standing around. All the cooking's in the kitchen. And uh, a lot of work went in to cooking in the kitchen, by the way. It was, the food was great, but the hunter-gatherer thing just didn't happen. Now, look, we're standing around the fire and uh, just talking and watching the fire. And you know what it's like when you watch fire? There's something about fire, uh, I think, I don't know if this is for everyone, but certainly for men, they stand around the fire, they look at the fire, and it brings back memories. Memories of when you went camping, or other times that you've stood around a fire, there's something basic and fellowship about it. So the fire, in this case, was just a symbol. We weren't actually doing a lot with it, but it brings back memories. And I start thinking at times I went camping with my kids or we did this or we do that. And I mention this because in today's passage there are a lot of symbols. But they're important because what they do is they bring back memories. They have meaning. And the meanings will be different for each one of us according to the journey we've taken in life. So we're going to be looking at that today. And I've, I've just... We're thinking about being strong and courageous, but I've, I've put strong and courageous in Christ. Now, how do these symbols that we're looking at today that start here in Joshua and have come right through to today, how do they help us to be strong and courageous in Christ, as to be strong and courageous as Christians? Now, one of the symbols is rivers. And uh, this made me think of a friend of mine who had a job high up in a big bank. And he decided that God was calling him to do something else. So he quit the bank and he went to work for a group called Many Rivers. Now, Many Rivers is a microfinance organisation that assists indigenous and refugee and financially disadvantaged people. That name, Many Rivers, is symbolic of the many challenges we face in life. You know, I have many rivers to cross. Uh, each challenge is a river we must cross and move forward. And this is an idea and a symbol that we find in various cultures and often in the music of those cultures. You may be thinking of songs about rivers. It's certainly quite deeply embedded in the Hebraic Christian tradition in which we are, but it's especially a metaphor for the freedom movement of black Americans. There are other significant symbol-type events in today's passage as well, and as it's too long a passage to go verse by verse, I'll just mainly be looking at those. And we're going to look at what these have meant to others in the past and then what they might mean for us today. So let me pray and then we'll get started. Heavenly Father, help us as we come to your word today to stand on the shoulders of many saints who have been inspired and guided by the way you led Israel into the land of promised rest. Help us to understand how this applies to us today. And by your spirit, 
inspire and guide us, we pray. In the name of Jesus, in whom all the promises of God are yes. Amen. Well, there used to be an expression, although I haven't heard it used for some time, but it went, you have to get your feet wet. Have you heard that? You have to get your feet wet. You may, people are looking at me, not sure. It means, in other words, sometimes you don't know how things are going to end and you won't ever know if you don't get started. So you step out in faith and you see what happens. And the saying may well come from here. Just looking at verse 7. This chapter 3, verse 7. The Lord spoke to Joshua. Today I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel, so they will know that I will be with you just as I was with Moses. Command the priests, carrying the Ark of the Covenant, when you reach the edge of the waters, stand in the Jordan. Now we always need good leadership in which we can have confidence, especially when we go forward to do something in faith. And Joshua, uh, who the Lord, and the word for Lord, by the way, somebody asked me, uh, when it's in capitals, L-O-R-D, that means Yahweh, the, the, the general name for God. Um, the Lord and various others keep telling Joshua, be strong and courageous. And here, though, he assures Joshua he's with him. And as he was with Moses, and any leader, I think, in the church, in any ministry, at any level, uh, must pray and listen to God and know that, that God is with you that you've said it before God, whatever you're going to do, however limited you might feel you are, that God is going to go before you and he's with you. Sometimes when you do this, God will give a sign of affirmation, a breakthrough moment. And here, of course, it is a most dramatic one as we read from part of verse 15. But as soon as the priests carrying the ark reached the Jordan, their feet touched the water at its edge, and the water flowing downstream stood still, rising up in a mass that extended as far as Adam, a city next to Zarethan. And the priest carrying the ark of the Lord's covenant stood firmly on dry ground in the middle of the Jordan, while all Israel, which we estimate now is about a million and a bit, crossed on dry ground until the entire nation had finished crossing the Jordan. Now, the Jordan River is not particularly big or difficult to cross. The three spies had apparently just forded it recently. The size of the river was not the point. The point was it stopped flowing. Now, we don't know how. It's been known to stop flowing since, due to earthquakes, at least three times. It can be a common thing to dismiss something as not related to God if you can explain it in some other way. But no matter what you do, you can't explain the timing. Earthquake, whatever it was, it happened right then. If we believe in God, We don't have any problem, as far as I can see, saying the cause was God. Irrespective of how it happened, God caused it. God brought it about. And uh, just for that, Psalm 114, if we've got it there. Yeah. Why was it, O sea, that you fled? O Jordan, that you turned back? And then it says there, tremble. O earth, at the presence of the Lord. So this passage here has people trembling at the presence of the Lord. Fearing the Lord, if you're from Israel, in reverence and holiness. And if you're in the land and about to be invaded, as we read, hearts are melting. So the way is made open by God. And that is the case, or it should be the case, with everything we do. 
I shared last week that I had a bit of a wilderness experience in my late 20s, mid to late 20s. My career path hadn't worked out, and this was partly due to its extremely long hours and many other things, but also that I preferred working at voluntary at the church. I stopped studying, I got another job. It was a lousy, horrible job, but it paid well. At this time, I was supposed to be discipling the boys in year 11 and 12 at school. But when it came to the questions of life, they seemed to know more than I did. I had to decide about the direction of my life, and with hindsight I can see that God led me to that point where I was forced to make a decision. I had to make a decision. Which way would I go? I needed to get my feet wet. I need to go in that river. And I decided I'd go to Bible college just for three months, just to get before God and try and figure out what I'm supposed to be doing. But I ended up, I loved it so much, I stayed for 12, but then I ran out of money. So I prayed and I got a part-time job as a youth worker at my church and about three other jobs at the same time so I could keep doing that work. And all the time, God was leading me forward, but I never knew what the next step would be. I always had to wait. And it's a great thing to learn, to just go on in faith. Maybe sometimes getting your feet wet more than once. Sometimes you just pray and you get started. And if you don't, I think you can choose to live without risk. And if you live without risk, I think you can live without faith. And that might be choice also, to live without God. I mentioned American slave songs. They're called spirituals. And they were the way that slaves held on to the hope of survival, both for the present and for the afterlife. As mentioned, uh, there have been several songs written about crossing rivers and some about crossing the Jordan. One is One More River, and that's the River of Jordan. There's another song, Deep River, for example. It's a song of hope and longing uh, for peace and freedom, both in the present and in the afterlife. The actual Jordan wasn't particularly deep, but crossing it left a deep and indelible mark on the people of God for it symbolises crossing from slavery to freedom, from death to life. The question to you and me is, therefore, have we crossed over? Or are we still longing for the flesh pots of Egypt, the Bible calls them, which symbolises not crossing, but turning back from God and his promises to a safe life, lived by sight only and not by faith, which ends up, ends up, as we've seen, being a wilderness. If you have crossed over, then are you trained and ready for action? I crossed over, but I wasn't particularly well trained or ready for action. So it was a little bit different there to what had happened with the people of Israel. We all have that different walk. We heard some at the men's night. I've lived a very easy and protected life, I think, compared to the, some of the uh, testimony that we heard there. Now today, we're sh sharing in the Lord's Supper, which Jesus commanded us to do in remembrance of him. In remembrance of him. As we share the Lord's Supper, it brings forth the memory of what Jesus has done in our life. It's a physical symbol that reminds us of God's love for us and our unity in Christ. There are two other physical symbols in today's passage that also help us to remember important truths. And one is the Ark of the Covenant and uh, another is the 12 standing stones. 
for the meaning of the ark to us. And I'm, what we can again uh, go to what others have said in the past. And in this case, the early church and the first Christian martyr Stephen in Acts 7, where he describes the tabernacle, which was the large tent in which the uh, ark was placed when the Hebrew, Hebrews camped, uh, where you, he says this. It's a bit of a long passage, we read it, but I think it's worth looking at again. So it's Acts 7 from 44. He says, <clears throat> Our ancestors had the tabernacle of the testimony in the wilderness, just as he spoke to Moses and commanded him, make it according to the pattern he had seen. Our ancestors in turn received it, and with Joshua brought it in when they dis dispossessed the nations that God drove out before our fathers until the days of David. He found favour in God's sight and asked that he might provide a dwelling place for God. But it was Solomon who built the, the, him the house. However, the Most High does not dwell in sanctuaries made with hands. As the prophet said, Heaven is my throne and earth my footstool. What sort of house will you build me, says the Lord? Or what is my resting place? Did not my hand make all these things? The ark, which represented the presence of God, moved around with the people, with the tabernacle. It was a symbol that God is not restricted to any place but is always with us. John 1.14 says, The word became flesh and took up re residence. That word for took up residence is tabernacled. The word became flesh and tab tabernacled among us, moved around with us, settled with us wherever we go. We observed his glory, the glory of the one and only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So God is always with us. The ark is gone, but Jesus travels around with us and he, in us, is the presence of God. Of the 12 stones, Joshua says, uh, and we're looking back now at Joshua, in the future, this is verse 21, in the future, when your children ask their fathers, what is the meaning of these stones? You should tell your children, Israel crossed the Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan before you until you had crossed over, just as the Lord your God did with the Red Sea, which he dried up before us until he had crossed over. This is so that all the people of the earth may know that the Lord's hand is mighty, and so that you may always fear the Lord your God. And in this case, we can go to 1 Peter chapter 2. And remember, this is not exegesis. This is just following themes and ideas that come forward from the Old Testament to the New. 1 Peter 2. So, rid yourselves of all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all slander. Like newborn infants, desire the pure spiritual milk so that you may grow by it for salvation. Since you have tasted that the Lord is good, coming to him, a living stone, rejected by men but chosen and valuable to God, you yourselves as living stones are being built into a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. You can see that all these things come after we cross the river, after we commit ourselves to God and go to take up his promises. In the same way that the 12 stones were a witness to what God had done among them, so we are living stones of witness, witness to what God has done and is doing in us. If your children should ask you about the stones of this building, does God live here? Uh, your answer would be something like, God does not live in temples made by people. But we are to be living stones in the true temple of God's people, 
where Jesus dwells. Mind you, it may be that uh, your son or daughter may look at you with a look of incomprehension when you said that. Um, Children, and a lot of us, we think far more concretely than that. I remember one church I was at, I I had a, 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 a white van. It was a Taraga. And uh, I used to drive this around visiting people. And then one day I took my wife's car instead. I went to visit a family and one child said, why has God not got his white van? (laughs) And you see how children, they're not working out who God is and where God is and how he dwells in our hearts and all those sorts of things. Children need concrete things. You know, Casey gets up here and does strong and bold and we learn verses. If they stick with us, meaning grows as we, we grow and get the understanding of them. So I'm sure you will find a way of explaining these things to your children but in more concrete terms according to their, their age. But we, we're just observing that, yes, God is here, Jesus is here because we're here. So when Christians gather... Uh, God is very much present uh, in the centre of what they do. And when they go away, this is just a building. But still, children and you and I will associate this place, when we see it, with the people who come here. That this is our church. And so we need a building or something that is our gathering place. And it does mean a lot in that sense. That we have one, that we build it, we pay it off and all the things we have to do. Now we come to chapter 5. And there are several uh, important ceremonies in various ways. The church has continued today. I'm always worried when I do that, I'll go, or something. Anyway, there we are. Now, we have here, uh, the first ceremony is a covenant renewal ceremony. It marks the end of the exodus from Egypt and the beginning of the conquest of the promised land. It's a ritual, and it required all the men to be circumcised as a sign they'd truly given their loyalty to Israel and to Israel's God. In verse 7, it says that the sons of the generation who had died had not yet been circumcised yet. And we know also there are many non-Hebrews, which the law, Genesis 17, would require all those non-Hebrews to be circumcised to show that they are going to be loyal. For us Christians, the ceremony uh, that we most use to mark joining the people of God and our Christian commitment is baptism. Now, the precise meaning of baptism varies according a lot to your tradition as to whether you're a Baptist or a Free Presbyterian or or Anglican or whatever. Uh, It ranges from strongly covenantal, that means when I'm baptised, it's joining the people of God and taking hold of the promise of God as covenant through to a quite individual thing where I personally, me and God, declare, I declare faith before God. So, for example, with the Ethiopian eunuch who was baptised by Philip and when he comes out, there's nobody there at all. He's on his own. A personal uh, decision to follow God. And baptism can be all these things. Uh, John the Baptist, of course, and Jesus uh, baptising as a repentance and then also as an entry into the kingdom of God. Then we have Stephen, and he has to say for us in the next bit here from, yes. Stephen says to the physically circumcised leaders of Israel, you stiff-necked people with uncircumcised hearts and ears. Hearts that do not change. Hearts that have not been operated on by the Spirit of God. Ears that do not 
hear the meaning, the spirit of God's words, but just the words. We sang a song about um, God's word not being words on a page. In Christian history and in other religions, uh, the book is so important. Uh, You cannot damage it. Uh, You have to have it on the top of the shelf. You have to keep it clean. You must not sit on it or put anything on it because it's the actual words that people worship. Now, we're not very clear that we do not do that. When we read the word, we believe it's working in us by the Spirit. If we couldn't read, it wouldn't be much good to us, but people can tell it to us and explain it, as is the case in a lot of the world today. Just reading some people got became Christians in Pakistan because uh, they heard Far Eastern broadcasting, the gospel being proclaimed by radio across those countries. And then the next thing you know, of course, they're being booted out of their house by the locals who do not appreciate it when someone gets converted. You stiff-necked people with uncircumcised hearts and ears, resisting the Holy Spirit as your ancestor did. You received the law under the direction of angels, it have not kept it. And that's a word to us, isn't it? That we are to keep God's law. Not just read it, not just know it, we are to do it. And that often requires us to do a bit of work, do a bit of study, do a bit of training, whatever it's required for us to be able to do it to the best of our ability. Circumcision was for Israel and baptism for us is an empty ceremony if we do not live it out in Christ. We come now to verses 10 to 12, uh, right towards the end of chapter 5. Put the heading there, let your sin roll off. The base of operations that Israel established after they crossed the Jordan and where the various ceremonies took place, they called Gilgal, which means rolling off. In the wilderness, no circumcision had occurred because it was a place of experiencing the result of the people's sin. The circumcision in Gilgal signifies a rolling off of that sin. The circumcision uh, is, uh, sorry, the rolling off is in, in anticipation of new life. So that that experience of the wilderness is corrected. And they are leaving that sin of faithlessness behind. So they have this covenant renewal ceremony ready to move forward. They've put that behind them, just as we do when we come to Christ and we know our sins are forgiven. We have to get down and show our loyalty to God. We join the people of God and we start living a new life. And it doesn't happen straight away very easily sometimes. Other times it does. It's different for each one of us. But if we cross that river, then we start a new life and the old life is put behind us. Whatever it is, is now washed away. The combination of the celebration of the Passover uh, with this, the eating of food from the land, uh, instead of manna, that symbolises that the restrictions of the wilderness have also been rolled off. That this is a new life. These people are going to start to eat the food of the land. They are going to celebrate new life in God. Today as we celebrate the Lord's Supper, the bread represents Jesus as the bread of life, which we now eat because Jesus has rolled away our sin and brought us new life. Our communion like the ceremonies we have read about today, is a symbol of that by which we remember what Jesus has done. I thought what I'd do today, just now as I finish, is instead of praying, I'm going to put up a covenant prayer. This is just taken from a covenant service of the Free Presbyterian Church, uh, and it's the sort of prayer you would pray say, at an annual general meeting after you've had it, maybe 
the next Sunday. You would celebrate communion, and it'd be early in the year. It could be around New Year, but we all go away then, so you're probably about February, March. And this is just part of our covenant renewal service, which would probably be communion as well. But I've just chosen this one, not for us to say now, because it's, it's, that's, we're not doing the covenant renewal today. And if you were, you'd want to give people warning, because there are quite a number of prayers like this. But just let me read this one. I'll read it slowly, and you might want to make it for yourself, but we're not doing it as a whole. It goes, As a company of people who have received Christ as Saviour, and by grace become God's children. We here and now dedicate ourselves to him. We desire to renew our commitment as a church of Jesus Christ, indwelt by the Holy Spirit, united to walk worthily of our profession, set apart to proclaim his word, to observe his commandments, and by grace to work according to his will, for the salvation of others and the well-being of his world. Amen. And you can see that that's a prayer that a church could pray maybe just once a year as they recommit themselves to God's service. There's a time and a place for that and I think every church have, should have something like that.